Good morning. Can I give everyone a very warm welcome along to our service this morning? Special word of welcome to visitors who are joining with us. We hope we feel at home as we gather together in worship today. In worship today. Uh, can I just highlight the, the <coughs> excuse me the program for uh, the week and uh, just to pay particularly uh, ask you to pay particular attention to Wednesday evening when obviously we have our prayer meeting at 7.30, our midweek fellowship at 8 in the lecture hall. And then we're meeting here as a congregation at 9 for our annual general meeting here in the meeting house at 9 p.m. There is some important business to do. Often this is just a matter of routine and we tick boxes and we move on quickly. But the, there's some important decisions about a plaque we want to erect, about... Uh, and be a change in our property trustees. So if you could come along, it'll be a brief meeting, no more than half an hour, but it'd be good to have you along if you can make it. Can I just ask that parents remember that after uh, Click is over, they are responsible for looking after their children. Uh, we, we love to see the boys and girls about the buildings here. But can we ask that, the, the, the boys and girls ask that you do not come in to the meeting house to run around after the service is over. That's not because the building is precious, but because you are, and we wouldn't want anything to happen to you. So yes, do please enjoy all the facilities, but don't run around in the meeting house, please, for your own safety. Finally, Becky's turn to talk to us about Holy Bible Club. Um, you'll be glad to hear that I'm the last one. There's only four of us. So um, the leaflets that Ellie Jane had promised have arrived, and we have absolutely a ton of these. So if you want some to distribute in your schools or other organizations, please come and speak to us. We have so many of them. And you can still sign up, and there are many different roles, um, not just helping with the kids. There's security, and there's the tea and coffee um, with the parents. If you want to help with those... Uh, it would be great if you'd sign up. We need to know how many leaders we have, roughly. So if you'd sign up via the Q QR code or we have um, sign-up sheets at the doors, that would be great. The first meeting for the leaders is Monday the 22nd, so it would be great to see you all there. And the kids' sign-up is live online now, so point your friends and family to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. Let's turn our hearts to the worship of God. In Matthew 26, we have the record of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Read in verse 26. Now as they, Jesus and the disciples, were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Let's praise God together as we sing our opening hymn, Ye Servants of God.
Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we come as your servants to adore you, to give you your right. Everything belongs to you. All that is has its source and being in you. You are the mighty God, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we, as your creatures, come to praise you, come to worship and honor your name. We come to sing to praise you. We come to serve you day by day. We come that you might meet with us now and bless us because we need you. If we're to do this well, if we're to worship you as we ought, we need your Holy Spirit empowering and enabling us for this task. So we come the thirsty to the, the water of life. We come as the hungry to the bread of life. We come as those who have forgotten the way home to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. So Lord, be with us to bless us now. We confess that we have not served you well. We have often lived primarily for ourselves and done what we want, but pleases us, ignoring your purposes, your plans. Forgive us. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash and make us new. Thank you that that forgiveness is freely offered through the cross. And may are pondering on this wonderful reality, stir our hearts all the more to glorify your name in every day you give us. For this we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're continuing our studies in the life of Joseph, and we're looking at the second half of Genesis chapter 47. Beginning to read at verse 13. Genesis chapter 47, beginning to read at verse 13. This is the word of God. Now there was no food in all the land. For the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock, if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For all the Egyptians sold their fields because this, the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. 
And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt. And it stands to this day. Cabbage will make you grow big and strong. Or those carrots are really good for your eyes. Have you ever seen a rabbit wearing glasses? And of course, all the boys and girls already know that to eat vegetables and fruit is really important. And I'm sure you all eat lots of that every day. And this morning in church, you'll see is a special Sunday. We have tables set for a meal. But there will be no steak, no burger and fries. No pasta, no pizza, no potatoes. There's just going to be a tiny bit of bread and a little cup of juice. But you know what? As we gather to share in this meal, we know this will make us strong. Not strong to run a marathon or climb a mountain, but strong as we trust in Jesus. Strong to live for him in this world when we're tempted to sin. Strong to stand up for him, to stand out for him when it might be so much easier just to keep quiet or to give in, to blend in with the crowd. Strong to soul who need love and care. We come together to eat this little meal, which has such a big, big meaning. Because it tells us, it reminds us that God so loved this world that he gave his only son. He died so that we can live. He gave himself so that we would have what we need. It reminds us of God's love and it stirs us to serve him and to love him in return. We're going to sing your hymn, after which you'll make your way out to click. Your hymn is God is So Good.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, as we come now to hear your word, we ask that our hearts would be responsive, that you would lead and guide us and help us to do what we ought to honor you. In obedience to your commands, we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. There can be those occasions when we are helped to see our own land in a different way through the eyes of visitors. I'm sure many of you will have had this experience as they bring a, a fresh perspective on the familiar. They can help remind you of the beauty of the land in which we live that sometimes we fail to appreciate because of over-familiarity. And they can challenge you to question those things that you've always blindly accepted because you've never known it any other way. That's just how things have always been. I had one of those moments 12 years ago now it was. I was driving a, a car full of Kenyans from Antrim to Randallstown. And if you're at all familiar with that road, you'll realize that the wall that marks the property belonging to Lord O'Neill runs three and a half miles along the left-hand side of the road. And of course, being the helpful tour guide, I enthusiastically explained to my guests that this was Lord O'Neill's estate. But as we drove, I began to experience a sense of ever-increasing unrest among my passengers. And by the time we, we got to Randallstown, they were greatly incensed that one man should own so much property. It seemed as if they were about to grab their pitchforks and march on Sheen's castle. And you know, that had never before ever crossed my mind. But seeing it through fresh eyes, I could understand a little bit of why they discerned this to be an injustice. One man should not possess so much land. And as we turn to this section of the story of Joseph this morning, we might begin to feel our hearts stirred in a, a similar fashion. As the years of the famine roll by, the people of Egypt realize that they are no longer able to pay for the food that they need with their money. All this grain that, that Joseph had in the previous years gathered safely into these vast storehouses. And you see the progression here as year passes into year. The people become slowly but surely more impoverished, while at the very same time, Pharaoh becomes richer and richer, growing in wealth and power. So we read verse 14. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And you ask, what money? And the answer is, all the money. Every penny that the people possessed has now stored up in Pharaoh's treasury. The people's money was gone, but the famine was not. So we read verse 17. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for their, all their livestock that year. And again, most of you will be familiar with this concept that in, particularly in Africa, a man's flocks and herds is his wealth. But now all of these two are in the possession of Pharaoh. Their money's gone, their herds and flocks are gone. But the famine is not. And the next year comes around, and yet again there has been no harvest. Verses 18, 19. When that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not 
hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So through the careful administration of Joseph, who back in Genesis chapter 41, verse 33, had, had suggested to Pharaoh that it would be a really good idea to select a discerning and wise man and set him over Egypt, all the while not realizing that, that he was the ideal candidate to fulfill this post that he had created. Now Pharaoh, one man, owns everything. What's your reaction? Are you incensed? Is Joseph being unfair? Does not even a little part of you think, could he not just have given some of the food away for free? And of course, we need to be so careful when we read these stories from millennia ago. Because we're ever in danger of, of believing that Things then should work as they do now, since everything works so smoothly and effectively here. You know, things are just as they ought to be here. So we want to read that into the story and condemn people when it doesn't work as we think, we think it ought. And really to understand this passage and to, to gain help from it, we, we need to read on down and to, to see the, the final outcome of all these negotiations in verse 23. And there's some things to note that are particularly important. And the first one is the people have their dignity because they have been able, through these arrangements, to pay their own way. And secondly, then, as a consequence, Joseph has not fostered a culture of dependency or entitlement where, where people you know, just take handouts. No, they're expected to work for what they will get. And at the end of the process, the result is that people have to pay 20% of their income to have a guarantee of seed for their fields and grain for their food. Think about it. All that they need to do to have all their needs for their well-being supplied by central government, they do this for 20% of their income. Ridiculous idea, isn't it? No one would put up with that, would they? And what is the attitude of the people to this set of circumstances? Are they up in arms? Are they protesting about how Joseph has enslaved them? Are they feeling hard done, They've lost their flocks, their herds, their land, their money? Look down at verse 25. There we read, and they said, you have saved our lives. May it please, my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. They are acquiescent, not anarchistic. They are docile, not defiant. They, they, they don't rebel. They rejoice in this set of circumstances. As they approach Joseph, it's, it's a little like God's people approaching him in worship. Psalm 35 verse 9, for example, says, My soul will rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because we are exalting in his salvation. Salvation leads to prayer. Being saved, the correct response of the child of God is to celebrate and to serve. Paul writes, you know the words in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 to the church in Corinth. He says, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Glorify God with or in your body. So last weekend, we were all invited to swear an oath of allegiance to the newly crowned king. 
I think it's safe to say that among those who gathered in Westminster Abbey last Saturday, there would have been those who declined this invitation to do so. But many voices were raised in objection. Just, just to Zoe Williams wrote, she writes, I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty, we're meant to say, and to your heirs and successors according to the law, so help me God. Across the country, in pubs where people previously drank together in peace, on sofas where marriages rubbed along perfectly well, people will give voice to this absurd word salad. A great chorus will go up from those of us who have been silent for years. No, I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. Or Mick Hume wrote in the Daily Mail, I would rather be a citizen than a subject. And so I won't cajole friends and family to swear allegiance to a hereditary monarch, his heirs and successors, so help me God if it's all the same to you. One survey said 84% of people would not swear allegiance to the king. Another said 76% would say no. And I'm not going to spark a, a debate on the future of the monarchy. That's not the point. But I want you to consider this question. To whom would you be willing to swear your undying devotion? Who would you believe would merit such a commitment? Might I suggest that perhaps you would do this to one who gave his life to save you from death. So a lovely little sermon illustration that tells how Cyrus, the first ruler of the Persian Empire, once captured a prince and his family. And when the family were brought before him, he released them all and set them free. And as they returned home, the, the prince turned to his wife and said, wasn't the emperor a, a grand, handsome, and imposing figure? And with a look of deep love for her husband, she said to him, I, I didn't notice him. I could only keep my eyes on you, the one who was willing to give himself for me. And that it is natural for us to want to offer our lives in service, to give heartfelt devotion to the one who saves us. And so much more for the one who would give his life for that cause. And as we come to the table this morning, as we partake of the bread and the wine, these elements that help us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, our hearts must be stirred to worship and to service, to offer up our lives as we have said. We express our thankfulness to Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we commit ourselves to serve him in our lives as our master. In the Old Testament, there are specific legal implications for slavery. A provision and legislation spells out what must happen, that if someone finds himself in, the, in difficult days, in times of hardship, they can submit to someone else to be their slave, their servant. But they must work for no more than six years. Six years, they commit themselves to serve this person who will protect and provide for them. And then after those six years, they must be allowed to go free. But there is an exception clause. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Exodus 21, Deuteronomy 15. Exodus 21, 5 and 6 says, But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free, then his master shall bring him to God. And he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. And the application and the implications are obvious. That if you truly love your master, you will never want to be free. 
You'll never want to leave his service. You will pledge your life to him. The 19th century evangelist George Muller understood the, the, the wonder and the joy and the privileges of being a servant of Christ. He wrote, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Muller and his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame of even my brethren and friends. And since then, I've studied only to show myself approved unto God. Look again at that commitment of the Egyptians. Verse 25, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. A willingness, an eagerness to enter into the king's service. Scottish theologian of our previous generation, Peter Forsyth, said, The first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. And it is to this that Jesus invites every one of us when he says those familiar words of Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Come to me. All you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Lovely words, but do you see that, that, that hint of contradiction in it? That if, you, that if you commit your life to serving Jesus, you will find this restful. If, if you bind yourself to his yoke, you will be set free. But that's a pattern that is discovered over and over again in Scripture. I'm sure many of you know the little prayer from the Anglican prayer book, which says, contains that phrase, in whose service is perfect freedom. This is the paradox. To serve the greatest master is to experience the greatest freedom. Again, the, the hymn writer George Matheson, the Scot, picks up this enigmatic idea. He writes, make me a captive Lord and then I will be free. Force me to render up my sword and I shall conqueror be. I, I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms. And strong shall be my hand. And so back to this question. That as we read these verses, we, we're, we're prone to ask, why, why couldn't Joseph just give the people the grain that they needed without taking their money, their flocks, and their land? Was that really necessary to steal these things from them, even their liberty? And that question has an echo. You'll have heard it before. People who don't grasp the beauty of the gospel will come and say, why can't God just forgive everyone? Why can't God just welcome everyone into heaven and say, look, don't worry about your sin. Why does God need to have all of me, even my liberty? You see at the, at the last table around the table, the last supper Jesus shared with his disciples. And he gave him a cup with wine and he said, Drink of it all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. You see, there's this obvious logical and the legal connection between the death of Jesus on the cross and the granting of forgiveness of men and women. God's justice, God's holiness were at stake. So God doesn't just forgive. Because he cannot just forgive. He must be true to himself. He must be true to his word. His word declares that without the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness of sin. If sin is to be forgiven, an appropriate payment, a sacrifice, must be made. A death must be died. A payment, 
a payment that equals the, the vast debt that our sin has brought against us, that we as sinners owe. 1865, El Vina Hall wrote these words. You know them. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. Why'd I owe anything? And the answer must be that the price that Jesus paid necessarily moves your heart to such an extent that, that it is your delight, your desire to give your all to him. And it's when you begin to grasp even a little bit of what Jesus has done on the cross for you. It's in the light of this that, that serving him for the rest of your days and throughout eternity will never be seen as a duty, but always as a delight. Eagerly you will say, I love my master. I will not go free. Let's pray to God. Father, we thank you for the love you have for us in Jesus. The price you paid on the cross. The gift you gave that we could never deserve. But this freedom demands our slavery. This free gift needs us to give our all in response. Lord, as we wrestle with this paradox, may we understand just the wonder of the, the gospel and the, the joy of loving and serving you, what it means to respond to what you've done for us. So we do eagerly offer up our lives to you. We do praise you for saving us, knowing what our sin deserves, that dread of hell and separation from you. May we, even this day, declare as we come to the table, I love my master. I will not go free. Amen. Just before we come to the table, we're, we're going to sing there as a redeemer. Can I let you know that the elements will be served in the coffee area as well as on the ground floor if you need to make your way there. Let's praise God as we sing, There is a Redeemer.
we're about to share in the sacrament of communion, drawing nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ and to one another in this act of fellowship. The bread and the wine and the invitation to eat and drink are his. We are his guests, and all who confess Jesus Christ as Savior and who serve him as Lord are welcome to share in this meal. Your communion tokens will be received. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. In Christ's name, I, I bid a warm welcome to new members joining the congregation on profession of faith. Alistair Barton. James Cunningham, Rachel Finley, Becky Irwin, Pamela Liggett, Elise McClelland, Ellie Jean Quinn, and Elizabeth Wright. Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they have been handed down to us by the Apostle Paul, recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we wait on you in these moments. For this is a time when you bless our hearts, when you, in fresh and vibrant way, make yourself real to us, reminding us of what we know but on too many occasions forget or neglect, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. A love that is confirmed at Calvary's cross where the sinless Son of God gave his life for us. His body beaten and bloodied, his life poured out there for our sin. Lord, we are blessed. We are privileged and honored, we are forgiven through this gift beyond compare. 
So as we take of bread and wine and remember that sacrifice for us, may our hearts be stirred afresh to, to serve and honor you in this world and with a new vigor, a new impetus and passion. Lord, bless us now. Touch our lives, we pray. Feed us, we ask in Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and wine and gave thanks that we might fulfill his institution. It is in his name and by his authority we take these elements of bread and wine to be used for this holy, mysterious meal. According to the institution, example, and command of our Lord Jesus, and as a memorial to him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
take, eat. This is the body of Christ which is given for you. This do in remembrance of him.
This cup is a new covenant in the blood of Christ, which is shared for you. Do this in remembrance of him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Surely someone's asking, what, what, what's all that fuss at the front? All that giving and passing things back. And is there not an easier way to do that that would get us out of here 10 minutes earlier without minister having to hand everybody a thing and then take it all back off them again. Looks like an awful palaver. Have you never asked that question? Just the way it's always been, you know. It's all about serving. The reason we do this is because we as elders in the church want to serve the people. I as teaching elder who's commissioned to, to teach the Word of God, I want to serve the elders. We, we, we're here to serve. We do this because Jesus Christ loved us first, and we, there's nothing we wouldn't do for his service and honor. So it looks like a fuss, and maybe in many ways we, we cover that up with shiny silver and crisp white tablecloths, even smart suits and largely brown shoes. But we're here to serve, and we're all called to serve Jesus Christ who himself modeled this for us and coming from heaven's glory, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray together. Father, as we wait on you in the stillness of this place, we pray afresh that we would hear that call to serve. Lord, we know the way the world drags us. It makes us the center of the universe, our wants, our desires, paramount. But Lord, we, we count for nothing if we do not count for Christ. Our life has no purpose if it's not expended day by day, hour by hour, for the honor of his name. So Lord, may this be a time when we anchor ourselves to that truth, Take our bearings from this table and go into the world guided by you. Lord, we pray for our fellowship. We give you thanks for those who have come into membership. We love each one of them and value them highly and pray that they, in the service they give in this place, would be a blessing to each of us and to your kingdom. Lord, we pray for those we miss who cannot be with us today. We ask you to be near them, particularly those who, with the passing of years or weakness of the body, 
simply can't be in the building, look after them and assure them of our concern and compassion for them. And Lord, as we come to this table now, as we show the Lord's death, we remember it before the world. May there be testimony. May there be witness. May the world take note that we know ourselves to be loved by a heavenly Father who claims us as his own. And may we show to them the, the blessing and the benefit that gives to our lives as we go out into the world in the week before us. Knowing we are loved, we love. So Lord, help us, equip us for that task. Lord, our world needs Jesus. Let us make him known. Be with all who carry his name across the world. We thank you for our mission partners. We commit them into your care. We pray for the fellowships in this town and community where Jesus is proclaimed. Build your church through them. All to the honor of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen. We're going to bring our time to a close as we sing a hymn of commitment. Oh, Jesus, I have promised.
just caught my eye and reminded me that I was meant to welcome him into membership and forgot. Ryan, you are welcome and hopefully not forgotten. Let's pray together. Lord, may your grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Never mentioned Francis Smith. <laughs>